Okay, year nine. So what you see before you is an example of your year nine travel writing exam. Now, I repeat, this is not the exam. This is just an example of the style of question that will come up. So there are two sections. There is a writing section where you will be creative and you will write your own non-fiction piece um, in response to a travel writing question. So it could be something like a time you went camping or a time you were scared or uneasy on holidays. And you will do lots of work in class with your teacher and they will make it very clear what the success criteria is in order to actually do well in that. However, section A, you can see, is the reading or the comprehension section, which in a way is employing all of the techniques that you need to employ in order to be successful for task B, your writing section. So as you can see, I have chosen a Bill Bryson sample, kind of like some of the stuff that we have done in class. This one is from A Walk in the Woods. So when you get a comprehension question, you must think to yourself, what kind of learner am I? Am I the person that sits at the end of the exam with 20 to 30 minutes to spare? Or am I the person that is always running out of time? And once you figure out the kind of person that you are, that'll help you figure out how to be successful in comprehension. So if you're the kind of person that is always ending up with loads of time at the end, it's probably because you're not going into as much detail as you could be for the actual question component. So what I would be doing is I would read the questions, I would read the passage, I would read the questions again, this time highlighting the key terms, unpacking the question, and then as I read the next time, I would highlight the bits that I think answer it, and then I would begin to answer the questions. If you're the person that always runs out of time, I would read the questions, read them again, highlight or underline and you'll probably tell me oh we're not allowed to highlight the exam but you can underline with a pencil as long as you rub it out. Uh, once I've done that I would then read the extract once underlining the bits that I think answer the question before reading the question again and going yep that definitely answers that or nope here's how I'm wrong. Okay that way you're maximizing um what you're really doing in the time frame and you're making sure that you have as much time as possible okay if you're the person that always misinterprets the question be that how many pe chains there are be that misunderstanding the question term and what it's looking for you really need to read the question carefully okay so the first one here is find two examples of similes in the extract and write them out first of all you need to know what a simile is but you do not need to identify what a simile is for the examiner. The examiner is an English teacher. They know what a simile is. You know, because you've got two examples and it's worth two marks, that all you have to do is write out the quotation Okay, for each of those similes. For question number two, looking at line six to ten, explore the effect of, Bill, of Bill Bryson's verb choices. You know based on this, because it wants you to consider the effect Okay, uh, for the next one, read lines 11 to 25. How does Bryson create unease? Again, it's worth six. So how does, the word how lets us know that we need to use point evidence explain. But so does how many marks it's worth. It's worth six marks. So you need to have at least, at least three really good chains there. Okay, half a mark for your point, half a mark for your evidence, another mark for your explanation. For line four, or for question four, look at lines 25 to 35. What can you say about the difference between Bryson's personality and Kat's? Again, you're comparing. And again, it needs point evidence explain. You need at least a quote for Kat's and at least a quote for Bryson. Again, look at the fact that all of these questions are telling you the lines it wants you to look at. So if for question four, you pick something that you learn on line 10 or something you learn on line 40, it's not going to be credited, okay, regardless of how good your PEE chain is. Finally, read from lines 35 to the end, how does Bryson show his mounting concern for his safety? So you need to constantly point out the fact that he fears for his safety, okay? It's worth nine marks, and it clearly wants you to use point evidence explain.
you have to focus on lines 35 onwards. Anything that goes before will not be credited. Clearly, it's also looking for words and phrases, okay, facts and details, all your language techniques like dialogue, verb choices, simile, personification, humour, anything like that. And in addition to that, things like tone, sentence structuring and punctuation for effect. So now we're actually going to read the comprehension and we're going to try to look for clues to help us answer the questions. So, in the extract below, Bill Bryson is camping in the woods with his friend Katz, or Stephen. He hears a sound and is concerned for his safety. Read the extract and answer the comprehension questions. Everything sounds big in the woods. This was true. Once, a skunk had come plodding through our camp and it had sounded like a stegosaurus. Now, one of our questions was about similes. So this is potentially one of our answers for that. sounded like a stegosaurus. So, uh, I shuffled on my knees. Sorry, there was another heavy rustle and then the sound of lapping at the spring. It was having a drink, whatever it was. I shuffled on my knees to the floor of the tent, cautiously unzipped the mesh and peered out. It was pitch black. I was quietly as I could. I brought my backpack and, with the light of a small torch, searched through it for my knife. When I found it and opened the blade, I was appalled at how wimpy it looked. It was a perfectly respectable appliance for, say, buttering pancakes, but patently inadequate for defending oneself against 400 pounds of ravenous fur. Carefully, very carefully, I climbed from the tent and put on the torch, which cast a distressingly feeble beam. Something about 15 or 20 feet away looked up at me. I couldn't see anything at all of its shape or size, only two shining eyes. It went silent, whatever it was, and stared back at me. Stephen, I whispered at his tent. Did you pack a knife? No. Have you got anything sharp at all? He thought for a moment. Nail clippers. I made a despairing face. Anything a little more vicious than that? Because you see, there is definitely something out there. It's probably just a skunk. Then it's one big skunk. Its eyes are three feet off the ground. A deer then? I nervously threw a stick at the animal and it didn't move, whatever it was. A deer would have bolted. This thing just blinked once and kept staring. I reported this to cats. Probably a buck. They're not so timid. Try shouting at it. I cautiously shouted at it. Hey! You there! Scat! The creature blinked again, singularly unmoved. You shout! I said. Oh, you brute! Go away, do! Cats shouted in merciless imitation. Please withdraw at once, you horrid creature! Ah, oh, clear off! I said, and lugged my tent right over to his. I didn't know what this would achieve exactly, but it brought me a tiny measure of comfort to be nearer to him. What are you doing? I'm moving my tent. Oh, good plan. That'll really confuse it. I peered and peered, but I couldn't see anything but those two wide-set eyes staring from the near distance, like eyes in a cartoon. I couldn't decide whether I wanted to be outside and dead or inside and waiting to be dead. I was barefoot and in my underwear and shivering. What I really wanted, really, really wanted, was for the animal to withdraw. I picked up a small stone and tossed it at it. I think it may have hit it because the animal made a sudden noisy start, which scared the bejesus out of me and brought a whimper to my lips. And then it emitted a noise. Not quite a growl, but near enough. It occurred to me that perhaps I oughtn't to provoke it. What are you doing, Bryson? Just leave it alone and it'll go away. How can you be so calm? What do you want me to do? You're hysterical enough for the both of us. I think I have a right to be a trifle alarmed. Pardon me. I'm in the woods, in the middle of nowhere, in the dark, staring at a bear with a guy who has nothing to defend himself with but a pair of nail clippers. Let me ask you this. If it is a bear and it comes for you, what are you going to do? Give it a pedicure? <laughs> I'll cross that bridge when I come to it, said Cat said implacably. 
What do you mean you'll cross that bridge? We are on the bridge, you moron. There's a bear out here, for Christ's sake. He's looking at us. He smells noodles and Snickers and... Oh, no. What? Oh, no. What? There's two of them. I can see another pair of eyes. Just then, the torch battery started to go. The light flickered and then vanished. I scampered into my tent, stabbing myself lightly but hysterically in the thigh as I went, and began a quietly frantic search for spare batteries. If I were a bear, this would be the moment I would choose to lunch. Well, I'm going to sleep, Cats announced. So, I found my two examples of my similes, and all I have to do is write them out. Now I'm going to focus at lines 6 to 10 and consider the effect of Bill Bryson's verb choices. So 6 to 10, I know that it's pretty much this paragraph here. Um, so I shuffled to my knees at the front of the tent, cautiously unzipped. So we have shuffled. We have unzipped, peered brought, searched, found, opened, was appalled, defending. So obviously it wants us to focus on shuffled, unzipped, peered. Um, clearly it uses verbs that emphasise his fear, his trepidation, how nervous he is. Um, shuffled is not a confident movement, it's something that shows that he's maybe sleepy, he's timid, he's hesitant. Uh, we probably know that it's not really sleepy because his concern is keeping him awake. So even though it's night time, that's not the predominant feeling there. So you want to really focus on how the verb choices highlight his nervousness. Okay. Uh, the fact that he then is hunting for something in his backpack with which to defend himself with again highlights the fact that he's very frightened. Note the fact that we've got shuffled cautiously and peered. So you've got rule of three, so shuffled, unzipped, peered to highlight how, I suppose, how terrified he is and how he needs to do all of these actions at once to instantly try and put his mind at rest. But it doesn't work, it just makes him more frantic. Um, and then the description of the knife is all very humorous, so when he finds it and opens it, again, there's an anticlimax here in those verb choices, as shown through uphold. Um, so it's just a matter of working those into PEE chains. And then we have read lines 11 25, how does he create a sense of unease? So again, this time round, we know that we are looking from here to here, okay? Hopefully you can see that okay. So, um, how does Bryson create unease? You've got the repetition of carefully. You've got, again, more verb choices. So climbed. Even something as simple as the adjective choice, distressingly feeble bean. Uh, his use of vague language, so something. I couldn't see anything all, at all of its. So lots of really vague language because you're not too sure what it is yet. Um, punctuation for effect, so of its shape or size, and you've got your sibilance, but then you have your dash as well. It went silent, whatever it was. And this is repeated throughout. So again, more repetition. And stared back at me. So silent and stared. More sibilant phrases throughout. Then we've got the dialogue, which clearly shows how frightened he is. So, Stephen, I whispered at his tent, did you pack a knife? So the dialogue highlights for us how frightened he is. He's whispering so as not to alert the creature. And he's clearly fearing for his safety, hence why he's thinking about weaponry. This is developed even more through the question, have you got anything sharp at all? So clearly he's thinking about defending himself. Then we look at despairing and the choice of words there that show his frustration that there's nothing to defend themselves with. There's also humour, anything a little more vicious than that because you see there is definitely something out here and again more vague language. Um, 
And then we have I nervously, so nervously through the adverb again highlights his hesitance and the fact that he's very frightened. The fact and details three feet off the ground let us know that it actually is something to be concerned about because it's not something as simple as a skunk. So again, if we go further beyond 25, we're not going to get credited for our material. So we need to make sure that we're actually focusing on the lines given to us. Um, then we have six marks available for that. So it's a matter of picking at least three techniques, and there's way more than three, and explaining them really well. Uh, kind of like some of the examples you've seen in class with the going surfing mark scheme. Then we have, look at lines 25 to 35, what can we say about the difference between Bryson's personality and Cat's? So we know it's this bit here. Okay. So the fact that Bryson has to report this to Katz shows us that Katz is, I suppose, the more rational one. He's the expert in this kind of thing, whereas Bryson feels like he's not as good at the whole camping thing. Um, Katz is really calm, as shown through the things he says, so probably a buck. They're not so timid. Try shouting at it. And then Bryson does exactly as he says, but cautiously. So he's not as calm. He's very nervous about what this could mean. <laughs> Look at the humorous dialogue that he used. Hey, you there, scat. And the exclamation marks. Clearly, the exclamation marks show us that he is much more terrified than his counterpart, than his friend. Um, then the fact that this obviously fails, and he feels the need to, obviously feeling silly about himself, make cats do it. To, I suppose, make himself feel better or see if cats has more success. And then we can see again how calm Katz is for the fact that Kat starts Katz starts taking the mick a little bit and teasing Bryson. He's clearly mocking him. He adopts this mocking tone as shown through the dialogue. Oh, you brute, go away, do. And merciless imitation. So the descriptors there and the verbs. Um, all of this, so shouted in merciless imitation, really highlights for us the fact that Katz is having some fun at Bryson's expense, as shown through the really overly polite, oh please withdraw at once, you horrid creature. He's really poking fun of Bryson. Um, Bryson does not appreciate this humorous take to a really frightening scenario. He's not as calm, he's not as level-headed, and he gets offended, as shown through the, oh, clear off. Um, so the whole way throughout this, Katz is being quite humorous, and then Bryson's verb choices kind of contrast with his. And then Katz is curious as to why Bryson is doing this. And when Bryson says, I'm moving my tent, Katz again quite sarcastically says, oh good plan, that'll really confuse it. So he's very sarcastic throughout, he's clearly teasing and mocking Bryson and how frightened Bryson is. Then we have... Read from line 35 to the end, how does Bryson show his mounting concern for his safety? You've got the repetition of peered and peered. Um, you've got like eyes in a cartoon, so the simile. You've got the contrast or juxtaposition of I couldn't decide whether I wanted to be outside and dead or inside and waiting to be dead. So some rather delightful options there. Um... You've got this rule of three to emphasise how vulnerable he feels. I was barefoot, in my underwear, and shivering. So it really paints a pathetic image of just how alone, how vulnerable, how terrified he feels, even with Katz's presence. And it makes him seem very victim-like. What I, what, what I really wanted, really, really wanted... So again, you've got the repetition of really, and you've got the punctuation that highlights his desire for this to happen, that highlights his concern for his safety, and the fact that he just wants these animals to leave him alone so he can peacefully get back to camping and not be so terrified out of his mind that he can't sleep. Um, I picked up a small stone and tossed it at it. I think I may have hit it because the animal made a sudden noisy start which scared the bejesus out of me. So you've got the humorous, scared the bejesus out of me, revealing his thoughts and feelings. You've got verbs such as picked and tossed, which highlight that he's so frightened that he does everything within his willpower, within his power, to 
try to make the animal leave him alone, to frighten the animal, to startle it, in the hope that it will run off, even though he knows it probably won't. Um, note the onomatopoeic whimper and the juxtaposition between it and Growl. So Bryson's reaction versus the creature's reaction and the fact that it's clearly not scared of him. Again, showing for us that Bryson is very frightened about the predicament he finds himself in, whereas the creature is not. Um, then we have Katz's calmness again, and Bryson querying how this is even possible. So the use of dialogue highlights his unease. Um, Katz actually tells us about Bryson's unease. He says, what do you want me to do? You're hysterical enough for the both of us. So the rhetorical question and the verb choice hysterical highlights the fact that Bryson is really winding himself up. He's really anxious. Then this really long dialogue where Bryson rants to Katz about exactly why he has every right to feel so frightened also shows us his mounting concern for his safety. So we've got a trifle alarmed um, in the middle of nowhere, in the dark, staring at a bear. So in the woods, middle of nowhere, in the dark, staring at a bear with a guy who has nothing to defend himself with but a pair of nail clippers. The listing here highlights and exaggerates just how dangerous their situation is if a bear were to attack. Then we've got the imperative, let me ask you this. And his rhetorical question and the humour, if it is a bear and if it comes for you, what are you going to do? Give it a pedicure. So the humour... Um, actually again shows us his concern because he's outraged that cats can be so calm about their safety. Um, again, the contrast between cats and Bryson. Cats is just so cool and collected, he's implacable. Uh, again, Bryson's outraged to him. What do you mean you'll cross that bridge? We're on the bridge, you moron. Obviously, they're not really on a bridge. Um, they're camping in the middle of the woods, so it's a metaphor for actually being in that scenario again showing that he is outraged that cats can be so calm and collected when it's a highly dangerous volatile scenario where they could end up being attacked by the bear and it could potentially ask, actually mean the end of their lives if the bear were to attack um again note the fact that there's things like you moron to i suppose lighten the mood a little bit so some derogatory language to show the kind of Manly banter between the two. There's a bear out here, for Christ's sake. He's looking at us, he smells noodles and snickers and... Oh no. So, you've got the short dramatic sentence, he's looking at us, he smells noodles and snickers and... Oh no. The fragmented sentence and the fact that he cuts himself off from his rule of three, or what would have been a rule of three, is really interesting because it shows us that something terrible has happened and it builds tension. Um... The short, what, oh no, what? So the repetition and the increasing concern through the repetition of that question again shows that something has developed that is a cause for concern. Then we have the short, dramatic, there's two of them. I can see them in a pair of eyes. Two consecutive short, dramatic sentences highlights the fact that Bryson is becoming increasingly panicked and he doesn't know what to do. The next thing is the torch battery going. And the fact that they're now completely in the dark, submerged in darkness, and they have no idea of knowing or seeing uh, if the bears actually are going to attack anymore because they have no light to try and hunt for the eyes to find where the eyes are. Uh, so again, lots of short dramatic sentences the whole way throughout. We've got the torch battery started to go, the light flickered and then vanished. Then we have Bryson's movements. So this is kind of like, I suppose, pathetic fallacy. It highlights just how precarious a scenario they're in. Then we have scampered, stabbing, hysterically in the thigh as I went, quietly, frantic search. So the verb choices are violent and they show his clumsiness. He can now no longer see. So he's accidentally stabbing himself with his butter knife that he, he found earlier. Scampered shows his fear. Frantic also shows his fear. If I were a bear, this would be the moment I would choose to lunge. And again, that violent verb lunge to show that the bear actually does present danger. Um, so, 
I've highlighted these things, I've noted them. You're probably not going to be able to highlight your exam paper, but you can underline it in pencil as long as you rub it out at the end. Now that I've looked through and puzzled out what my potential answers could be, I need to figure out how many I need. So I've got nine marks available. So I'm going to attempt to come up with at least, at least five really decent chains, if not, maybe more. Uh, and I'm going to make sure that my analysis is key. So when I'm analysing this, I'm not just going to reword the quotation. So for something along the lines of, what do you mean you'll cross that bridge? We're on the bridge, you moron. I wouldn't just say, the use of dialogue shows that Bryson fears for his safety because he's questioning cats and saying he's a moron. That's dull, it tells us nothing. I would say something along the lines of, Bill Bryson shows his mounting concerns for his safety through his irate interchange of dialogue with cats. This is shown in, what do you mean you'll cross that bridge? We're on that bridge. The use of italics highlights for the reader Bryson's outraged tone and the metaphor depicts for the reader that Katz's claim about worrying about that bridge when he comes to it and crossing that bridge when he comes to it is ridiculous because they're already in the difficult scenario that the metaphor depicts. Therefore emphasising that Bryson has every right to be fearful and in worrying about their safety is actually behaving much more sensibly than Katz. Full stop. That's the kind of PE chain you want to aim for, not something that just repeats the quotation or the initial point you've made, okay? Because that's not analysing anything, that's just regurgitation. Hopefully this has been helpful. Again, you can see at the bottom here that I've also come up with sample chains, or sample chains, sample P, um, creative components, so the kind of style of non-fiction writing that you might be asked in your exam. So you're going to write your own travel writing piece, you may respond to either A or B, and you probably won't get an option. A time you went camping or a time you were scared or uneasy on holidays, and you obviously have to plan that out. It's worth 20 marks, whereas the comprehension is worth 24. So hopefully this has helped and hopefully it will give you a flavour of the style of question that you're going to be asked in the exam, and good luck!